good morning, everybody. Um, as, as Matt said, uh, my name's Andrea Catons, and I'm part of the, the REACH CLP and, and PIC team in uh, HSE's Chemicals Regulation Division. Um, in particular, I lead on the, the delivery work that we do uh, on the operation of, of CLP. Uh, and as Matt said this morning, I just want to provide you with uh, a few key updates about CLP, um, some of the things we've picked up from the last couple of weeks based on our experience and some feedback we've received during those first, uh, first few weeks. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, um, so the first thing I wanted to note um, is that the main duties under CLP, uh, the duties to classify, to label and to, to package um, substances and mixtures that are placed on the market both in Great Britain and Northern Ireland uh, haven't changed. Um, the GB CLP regulation um, has adopted the, the United Nations Globally Harmonised System, the UNGHS, uh, in exactly the same way as the EU. Um, so we're still applying the same hazard categories and the same hazard classes, etc., uh, and the same criteria will apply. Uh, however, that there have, of course, been changes, uh, and in particular, this includes changes to, to some of those processes uh, that were managed centrally by the EU, um, by the European Chemicals Agency. So, there are new arrangements um, for GB mandatory classification and labelling, uh, which will replace the EU harmonised classification and labelling system in Great Britain. Um, there are also new arrangements for notifying information to HSE as the, the GB CLP agency instead of the European Chemicals Agency, and also uh, new requirements for submitting requests to use alternative chemical names. Um, there are also some differences between the, the EU system and the system in Great Britain um, regarding the duties under Article 45 of CLP. Um, and uh, as you'll be aware, that's the requirement to submit information to uh, poison centres. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so taking some of these uh, in turn. Um, in Great Britain, we're going to have a new or we will have a, a new GB mandatory classification and labelling system, which has now been introduced. Uh, a mandatory classification is a, a classification that is legally binding, and this will apply in exactly the same way as a harmonised classification was applied previously and continues to be applied under EU CLP. Um, substances which have a mandatory classification are listed in the GB mandatory classification and labelling list or the MCL list uh, and those classifications have to be applied to those substances when they are placed on the market within Great Britain. <clears throat> The GB mandatory classification and labelling list is now hosted uh, on the, uh, on the uh, HSE website and it will be managed and operated by HSE. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, as I say, the, the, the mandatory classification labelling list is now available on the HSE website and I provided the link to, to the list in the slide here. Um, uh, as you'll see, or, and many of you will be aware, the information uh, is presented in a similar way uh, to which it's found in the, the CLP regulation itself, uh, and many of you will be familiar with that. Uh, it's provided as uh, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, and as I say, can, can be accessed from the, the link provided there. One thing I wanted to point out with the with the list is um, there are some columns towards the right hand side of the list which relate to the the dates of application for the entries and the latest dates of compliance um, for for those uh, entries. Uh, at the moment, uh, many of you may have noticed that these columns are currently blank. Um, the intention is that these uh, columns will be populated as we move forward and as new substances and new entries are added and uh, current entries are updated in the list. So those columns uh, will be updated as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, of particular note, uh, I wanted to point out that the, the mandatory classification and labelling list does contain all of the entries from the, the so-called 14th and 15th ATPs to CLP. Um, 
However, um, some of you may have noted, and as I said previously, um, the, the columns in, in the mandatory classification labelling list relating to, relating to the dates of compliance are currently blank. Uh, and I think that may have led to some questions uh, about the dates of application for these particular entries. Um, so I just wanted to confirm that because these are... Um, uh, delegated acts part of the retained law, the dates from the 14th and 15th ATP will continue to apply and they will be the latest dates of compliance for these particular entries. So for the 14th and 15th ATPs, these will be the 1st of October 2021 and the 1st of March 2022 respectively. Um, the entries in the 17th ATP to CLP have not been included in the GB MCL list uh, to date. Uh, the reason being that the 17th ATP uh, had not entered into force at the point at which uh, the transition period ended and therefore they weren't automatically carried forward. Um, however, the, the proposed changes from the 17th ATP will be considered separately by um uh, the, the arrangements for the mandatory classification labelling process under GBCLP. The, the full arrangements um, for the mandatory classification labelling process and how we'll handle these substances uh, is now provided on our, the classification pages of the HSE webpage and, and you can have a look at that for further information about how the mandatory classification and labelling process will operate in Great Britain. Uh, next slide please. So moving on to, to notification, um, where required, notifications must now be submitted to HSE and they must be submitted within one month of placing a substance on the market within Great Britain. Um, the duty to notify um, in Great Britain applies to um, Great Britain. Uh, GB-based manufacturers and importers, and also to Northern Ireland-based suppliers who supply qualifying Northern Ireland goods directly to the, the market in Great Britain. The substances that are in scope of notification uh, remains the same as it did under the EU system. So this is uh, substances which are classified as hazardous when they're placed on the market by themselves or as part of a mixture where they contribute to the classification of the mixture. And also for substances which are subject to registration under REACH. Um, however, we just wanted to point out that where a notification has already been submitted to the European Chemicals Agency and that information has been included in the classification labelling inventory before the end of the transition period, there is no requirement to, to re-notify that substance in Great Britain uh, unless there is a change to the classification that has already been notified. So this includes notifications that have been made by uh, GB-based manufacturers and importers, um, non-GB-based manufacturers, manufacturers and importers uh, whose substances were placed on the market in Great Britain uh, before the end of the transition period and where those supply chains continue, and also by Northern Ireland-based suppliers um, supplying directly to the GB market uh, with substances defined as, as qualifying Northern Ireland goods. Um, also, uh, where a substance has been registered under REACH, uh, there is no need to, to submit a separate notification uh, under the GB notification arrangements. Uh, next slide, please. So notifications are submitted via an online web form and the web form is now available uh, on our website and again I've provided the link to the notification web form in this slide. Um, I've also provided uh, an overview of what the form currently looks like just to give you uh, a brief idea and so you know what to, to expect when you access the web form. Uh, the form itself will take you through uh, and prompt you with the, the information to input into the form. Um, um, outlining uh, which information is mandatory and has to be completed before you can move on to the, the next step of the form. Uh, at the end, you will then be informed that the, the notification has been submitted uh, and you won't have to take any further action unless there is a need to update the information in the notification. Um, you can also uh, download a, a PDF copy of the information that's been notified uh, for your own records. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, briefly, um, 
just wanted to point out that the the information required as part of a notification uh, will remain the same as it did in the EU system or as it is in the EU system. So this includes uh, information to identify the, the notifier, so the name, address, contact details of the notifier. Um, yeah, information to identify the chemical, so the chemical name, uh, IUPAC name, EC number, CAS number, etc. Uh, information on the, the formula, um, where that information is available to you. Um, information on the classification, including the hazard classes, category codes and hazard statements as applicable. And where a substance is not classified for a particular hazard class or category, a uh, justification for the absence of that hazard. So, for example, this could be um, where data is lacking um, or, or where data are conclusive but not sufficient for classification, for example. Uh, it's also a requirement to submit specific concentration limits, M factors, acute toxicity estimates where they exist uh, and again where they're applicable and also the appropriate labelling information um, um, so far as it's applicable to the notification. Next slide, please. Uh, very briefly, I just also wanted to refer to the, the request to use an alternative chemical name. Uh, again, the, the guidance and the process for doing this is now available on our website, uh, and I provided a, a link to the pages for you to, to access this. Um, requests are submitted by um, downloading a Word form, which can then be emailed to us um, and the information uh, is, is provided on the website with clear guidance about um, how to submit it. The um, type of information to submit and the conditions under which an alternative name can be requested remain the same as they did under the, the previous system in the EU. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, um, I just wanted to touch on the uh, requirements for um, submitting information to poison centres uh, under Article 45 of CLP. We're aware that there have been a number of questions uh, about these provisions in particular uh, and how to go about submitting the information and what needs to be submitted. Um, so the full provisions of Annex 8 of CLP were, were not in force at the end of the transition period uh, and therefore these provisions weren't included in the GB CLP regulation. Uh, as such, the existing or the, the previous requirements uh, continue to apply when mixtures are placed on the market in Great Britain. So this means that uh, a safety data sheets uh, as applicable can be submitted by importers and downstream users of mixtures to the National Poisons Information information service as appropriate. Uh, in Northern Ireland, the, the, the situation is slightly different. Um, obviously, the provisions of EU CLP continue to apply in Northern Ireland, and this means that the, the provisions of Annex 8 of CLP will also apply. Um, under these arrangements, uh, it's still necessary to submit information to the National Poisons Information Service. However, the type of information to be submitted is, uh, is different. Um, in the UK, uh, the Department of Health and Social Care, with support from the devolved administrations, have lead responsibility for the, the appointment and the operation of poison centres um, under Article 45 of CLP. And recently, colleagues in the Department of Health uh, have published some guidance about these provisions on their website. And again, I've included a link um, to that guidance uh, in the slide that's available today. Uh, in particular, this provides information on the type of information to be submitted, whether it's in Great Britain or in Northern Ireland, and how that information should be submitted. Now, uh, as the Department of Health uh, are the lead um, department for these requirements, we in HSE are somewhat limited in the advice we, we can provide on poison centres. Um, so I would uh, advise anybody with questions to, to first of all, to, to look at the guidance provided on the website. And then there are some contact details both provided on this slide and on the website to enable you to get further advice should you need it um, about submitting information to poison centres. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so on this slide, I've just included um, some links for you with some further information. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, HSE's chemical classification web pages uh, have been updated and are now available to access and the link is available there. Um, further information on supplying chemicals to Northern Ireland specifically is also available uh, and again, I provided a link to that. Um, there's also a link to the, the statutory instrument with the details of the changes um, to C CLP. And then um, I've also provided a link to the EU CLP regulation on the ECHO website, which again um, has lots of useful information still available there. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you possibly got through uh, caught you by surprise didn't it, Andrea, in terms of uh, <laughs> your prepared times. Not, not a problem that's uh again many many thanks for that comprehensive and uh detailed run through and again i think focusing on on some of the actions that people need to take is is is, is really uh, important for today's session um so we have um as, as ever uh, we've got a number of questions come through the portal but we, we managed to pick out a few uh, earlier um to just start the conversation off and, and they're on the slides uh, in front of us. So should we just um, should we just pick pick a couple of these? Out? So let's start through with the first one, uh, Andrew. Uh, so this, uh, I guess, notification on behalf of a group of uh, legal entities that are manufacturers and importers can can, can notifiers do that? Yes, they can. Um, notifiers can still uh, notify uh, as part of a group. Um, the, the earlier slide that I showed with the screenshot of the, the notification uh, web form, actually, if you have keen eyes, you can see near the bottom of that, it does actually show you the group notification uh, facility. Um, of course, when submitting as part of the group, I think it's important to remember that the, the individual uh, importers and manufacturers are still responsible for the information that's submitted. Uh, and there should be agreements between the members of the group and the, the person, the leads uh, notifier submitting the information um, that everybody is, is, is um, uh, in agreement and aware of their responsibilities and duties. Thank you, Andrea. And I think... Um and then the second one is, is about a bit of the, about the process. And we've also had, I think it links to a, a question that uh, Daniel Camaro uh, has, has come in through the sky. But, but essentially about the process about this, and particularly within the sea, are we going to be able to allow bulk uploads or uh, mass uploads of notifications? Perhaps, if not now, are we looking to do that in the future? Are you have a view on that? Yeah, in the current system that we have, the the, the web form which I, I showed previously, we, we don't currently have a, a bulk upload um, facility. Uh, we are continuing to look at the the, the notification web form uh, and we will uh, likely make some changes to that in the future. Um, so it's something that we will keep uh, in mind and under review. But at the moment, that facility doesn't exist now. Hmm. So the process is the question is the process that you set out in the in the screenshots and, and people need to look at that and, and follow that and, and, and and look at that notification process. yeah yeah currently notifications have to be submitted uh, on an individual basis yeah yeah brilliant again so question three obviously uh we've heard from uh alan and, and rachel earlier about the difference between northern ireland uh and gv but again just in terms of the clp mm -hmm. regime uh andrea what in terms of item supply to northern ireland what is the what what, what is the duty to which laws do they comply with yeah, so in a similar way, um, in Northern Ireland, the requirements of the EU CLP regulation continue to apply. So where goods are placed on the market in Northern Ireland, it will be necessary to continue to apply with, uh, to comply with the requirements of the EU CLP regulation. Um, so for example, that will include notification to the European Chemicals Agency uh, and that kind of thing. So they will comply with EU CLP and not GB CLP. Uh, of course, where goods move from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, it will be necessary to comply with the, the requirements of GB CLP uh, instead. Yeah, and that links through to the next question as well around, this is about the labelling, isn't it, yes, Andrew? Yeah. And, um, you know, the the, the, the address, uh, particularly for, for GB CLP, and I don't know whether we've had any questions in around uh, exporting over to the EU, but current, you know, you might want to touch on that in your answer, but in terms of this specific mm -hmm. question, um, you know, does it require a GB address and phone number? Yes, it's, it's a simple answer. Yes. When um, when you're placing a chemical on the market in Great Britain, um, there is a requirement to have the, the contact details, the address and telephone number of a GB based supplier. Um, if the goods are moving from Northern Ireland into Great Britain, it can be the Northern Ireland based supplier supplying directly to the GB market. 
um, where goods move into the EU, uh, then of course these will need to comply with EU CLP and there'll be a requirement to have the, the contact details for an EU-based supplier on the label. Um, it will be possible to have um, more than one address on the label. Um, where this is the case, um, it, for example, in, in Great Britain, we, as I say, we want to see the address of the GB supplier, but it would also be possible to include the address of an EU-based supplier, but in the supplemental information. Uh, and importantly, uh, that mustn't cause any confusion over where a recipient or a user of that chemical would go for further information. Uh, it must be clear to the importer that the, the address of that other EU supplier can provide additional information uh, and that there is agreement to provide all of those details on the label between the relevant parties. Yeah, and that's really comprehensive, Andrew. And I know that there'll be um, delegates on the line sort of sort of trying to get, understand the, the difference between um, compliance with the GB uh, uh, regulations and also yeah. with the markets back into the EU. And I think you know this is one of the, the clear uh, issues from the CLP side is the labelling and how they can yeah. uh, make sure that their goods can get exported. So so we're more than happy to carry on those conversations. Um, yes, absolutely. With the, with the guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay, could we have the next slide, please? We've got a couple more questions on here. Um, so, uh, so how do we go about uh, requesting a change uh, to a mandatory classification? Okay, um, if a, a manufacturer, importer or, or downstream user has information to suggest that uh, an existing mandatory classification uh, needs to be updated, then they must submit information to us. Uh, and again, information about how to do that is provided on, on our web pages, information about our new mandatory classification and labelling process. Um, I think in the first instance, um, I, I would urge anybody um, doing this to, to get in touch with us uh, through our, our help desk or our, our mandatory classification and labelling contact details just to, to ask for more information about how they might want to go about doing this in the first instance, the kind of information to submit, how to submit it, the, the, the format to use. Um, so I think that that's what I would suggest someone wanted should, should do if, if they wanted to um, request a change to a classification. Um, but there is a process in place to allow that to happen. Uh, and again, it's very similar to the EU system. Um, previously, when we had harmonised classification and labelling. Um, if a supplier had information to suggest a change to an existing harmonised classification, they would approach a member state competent authority. So much the same, if, if a supplier has details to suggest a classification should change, then they can approach us and we can look at that for them. Thanks, Andrew. I, I, I think that the next two, six and seven are linked, but I think you also addressed those in your presentation. But just, yes. let's, just for a reminder, yeah. there was obviously some, um, you know, quite a lot of uh, questions around ATP. So just to reiterate, for the 17th adapt, uh, Adaptations of Technical Progress, the 2019 RAC opinions, I think in your presentation, you said because that hasn't been, that wasn't retained, that didn't, the deadline meant that it wasn't retained in, in uh, GB law. Uh, so um, do you just want to explain what the process again is, how we're looking at those 17 uh, ATPs? Yeah, so, so as I said in the slide, and as you just said, um, because the 17th, 18, 17th ATP um, hadn't entered into force at the end of the transition period, we didn't uh, automatically carry that forward uh, as entries in the mandatory classification labelling list. Uh, however, we do have a process um, to, to uh, develop um, GB mandatory classification and labelling for substances which come through the EU process. So where a RAC opinion is developed on a substance and that is published, we then have a process to follow where we will um, take that through uh, and develop a, a GB mandatory classification and labelling opinion and as appropriate update the, the GB mandatory classification and labelling list. Uh, and that is a process that will be happening uh, shortly for all of the substances that were included in the 17th ATP to CLP. And then I think question seven, that links, doesn't it? I think that was in relation to the 14th and 15th yep. around those deadlines. Yes, yeah, yes that was, yeah. That was the 14th and 15th ATP. And as I said, I think there has been a little bit of confusion uh, regarding the dates, the latest dates of compliance for those um, those entries. And as I said, they, they are the same dates as in the EU system um, with, with them being retained pieces of EU law. Um, so they, they will they will apply uh, as um, at the same times. Yeah, uh, of course. Um, in the same way as they would have done in the EU system, these are latest dates of compliance uh, and people should move to, towards them as soon as is, is possible for them. 
Yeah, great. And I know you said that, uh, just talking to the last question on that slide before we open it up to the other ones, it's around poison centres. We know that you said the Department for Health and Social Care are the lead. Yes. Is there any further um, uh, insight you can give as to how uh, the notification process is likely mm -hmm. to work for poison centre notifications? Um, yes, as, as, uh, as I said, the, the, the lead authority is DHSC, so they have um, all of the details and they're able to provide more information. Um, as far as I understand it, information uh, both in Great Britain and Northern Ireland has to be submitted to the National Poisons Information Service, the NPIS, uh, and that has to be provided to them, I believe, by email, even for Northern Ireland. Uh, we no longer have access to the ECHA um, PCN portal, um, and so information will be uh emailed to NPIS. The type of information and the nature of information to be submitted uh, under the Annex 8 requirements will be different um, to those under the GB requirements where it's simply, um, uh, as it always has been, just the submission of a, of a safety data sheet, for example. Um, and again, full information on the nature of the information to be submitted and how to submit that information is now provided on the, the DHSC website. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Andrew. So if we can move to the next slide, uh, please, and then I'm just going to, this just sets the background again. Uh, this is the help desk that is uh, run by uh, certainly uh, Andrea's inputs and, and works with uh, people in her team to, to serve as that. So do do put some of the questions in if you've got detailed questions on that. Let's just see what we can do in the next um, sort of eight, five, five, eight minutes on some of these other questions. So again, you're on the slightly on the back foot, Andrea, but let, let's see what we can do. And I think there's a, there's a helpful... Um, just a clarification from, from Jenny from Whitcam Limited, and this is about CL, CLP notifications versus REACH notifications. So just I think you mentioned it in your talk, uh, Andrew, but just to clarify, mm -hmm. do we need to make a CLP notification when putting a new product onto the GB market if a REACH registration has already been made in UK REACH? Uh, if the substance is registered under REACH, then no, there is no requirement to submit a separate notification uh, for CLP, no. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that's a, that's a, um, a, um, a hopefully straightforward one. And here's one from Thomas Graal from Edding International. Um, it's about EUH statements, which I hope you know what that means, uh, Andrew. Uh, so uh, this is where we have to label EUH statements in GB. Yes, the, the EUH statements will continue to, to apply, yes, yeah. okay. even though they're called EUH statements, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you for that, Thomas. Hopefully uh, that that helped. Um, so I've got um, a couple of questions related from uh, Chris Chris Webb from Wessex, Wessex uh, Residents and Adhesives. Thanks for these double questions, uh, Chris. Um, so one is about um, our EU, EU, so I'll read them out verbatim, Andrew, just so I get the, the question right. So can we include our European importers' details on our label for distribution in the UK, even though they are not part of the supply chain? Mm -hmm. um, and if yes, is there a particular, how would you advise that? And then with regards to the requirements for a phone number, uh, does this have to be a UK number or could it be an overseas number? And I think you know, covered that in your presentation. So first, can we include our European importer details on our label for distribution, even if they are not part of the supply chain? Yes, um, it, it is possible to include the EU suppliers' details. Uh, I think, as I mentioned uh, a little, little while ago, um, the way in which that should be done is, is as part of the supplemental information on the label. Um, and as I said, it is, it's very important that any information provided um, it doesn't cause confusion or cast doubt over the, the required information, which would be the, the GB importer's details. Um, also, as I said, it, it's important that, that the, um, the EU supplier is aware of those arrangements and that they're able to provide more information should they be contacted um, and, and that those arrangements are agreed. But the bottom line is, yes, it should be possible to do that. And the um, phone, num phone number, phone number yeah. um, yep. So in terms of phone number, um, the, the regulation itself doesn't actually specify um, where the phone number should be based. Um, uh, however, it does say it should be for the supplier. So it should be a, a, a phone number that the supplier is is uh, associated with. Um, and again, uh, the most important thing is that that number is, is a number that can be contacted uh, should a, a recipient or a user need more information about that chemical uh, and that that service is able to provide the required information um, based on, on that chemical. Um, so, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, 
a, a GB base number, but it needs to be a number that is associated with the supplier and can get more information as necessary. Great. No, I think that's, that's comprehensive. So thanks, uh, Chris, for that question. So um, I've got a question on uh, safety data sheets from uh, uh, Dave Spade from uh, Global uh, MSDES Limited. Uh, and particularly the question is what needs to be stated in Section 15 of a safety data sheet? And I think the follow-up question is what is, what is, how is, what is mandatory rather than minimum? So what's the, <laughs> the mandatory versus minimum sort of conundrum? Okay. Um, uh, of course, the, the full requirements for safety data sheets are, are part of the REACH regulation. Um, I think section 15 is about um, uh, maybe additional information that isn't um, elsewhere within the safety data sheets uh, and other um, information required from other, other regulatory areas. Um, of course, the information on classification labelling has to be provided in section two of the, of the safety data sheet. Um, in terms of uh, what is mandatory, um, then the, the information on the mandatory classification labelling as provided in the mandatory classification labelling list has to be applied to those substances. Um, however, if a supplier has information um, to show that the, the classification criteria for an additional classification are met, then the mandatory classification can be added to. Um, so hopefully that answers the question that what's in the list has to be applied, but it can be added to if there's information to um, to show that a different an additional hazard is applicable. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, hopefully that um, uh, picked up that question. Um, sorry for putting you on the spot for section okay. 15. Um, <laughs> I think there's just a, an, I think you touched on it, but maybe just a question from Jeffrey uh, from ChemSage Limited around what will be the process for the review and updating of the UK list? And I guess it links to, you know, how, how we're going to be looking at RAC, what about the consultation? I guess there's going to be any stakeholder engagement on that. Is there anything you've given any thoughts as to how we engage people on the process for a, reacting to a RAC opinion, I guess, isn't it? Yep. Um, in terms of, of updating the mandatory classification labelling list and, and the new process for that, there are essentially two streams, if you like, two different ways in which we can approach that. Um, the first one will be um, looking at the RAC opinions and the information that comes through from the EU-based system. Uh, and that's one side. And the other will be approaching... Um, our own GB-based mandatory classification labelling work. So, for example, this may be chemicals that stem from our work on biocide and pesticide active substances, uh, things that we pick up from REACH and as part of our wider chemicals work. Um, following the, the RAC opinions, um, of course, that there is... Um, already opportunity to input into that process during the, the ECHO public consultation uh, and that stage of the process. Um, on the, the other side of, of the, the work where we do our GB mandatory classification labelling work, we will have a, a public consultation on any proposals that we, we generate. Um, there will, of course, be a technical aspect and a policy aspect, uh, and there will be uh, opportunities for, for stakeholders to engage with us on, on both those processes. 